Welcome back guys, Anime Scale here and today we are going to rank all Jonin of the Hidden Leaf. This time we are ranking all of them, including the Kanoichis and the Jonin in Baruto. Do keep in mind this won't include people we've only seen in flashbacks like Minato or Shisui. Now without any further ado, let's get started. Starting off the list is Abisu. You all might remember Abisu as being Konohamaru's guardian and tutor, so naturally you'd think he'd at least be stronger than him until he becomes an adult, but you'd be wrong. During Pain's attack on Kanoa, Ibisu was worse than useless. This is the only time we've seen him seriously fight, and he couldn't do anything against the Naraka path. Despite trying to save Konohamaru, it was the young Genin who had to come back and save him. Not a great showing for a Jonin. The only two techniques we see him use are the Shadow Clone and the Fire Dragon Bullet, techniques that even Academy students like Obito, Sasuke and Itachi were already capable of doing. Even the series goes out of its way to use Ibisu mostly as comic relief, and his actual skills as a ninja don't really give us any reason to think otherwise. Shizune isn't really supposed to be a powerhouse when it comes to fighting. She's a medical ninja through and through, and when it comes to just that, she's one of the most capable people in the entire Leaf. When it actually does come to straight out fighting, she's a lot more underwhelming. Shizuna is a poison expert who really only has a few things you need to worry about when fighting her. She can emit poisonous gas from her mouth that is fatal even if only a whiff of it is inhaled. She also usually coats ninja tools in deadly poison. That's kind of about it when it comes to her fighting abilities. This is only highlighted when she takes on Kabuto to protect Sanade, and it goes about as well as you'd expect. Kabuto was surprised at the start, but he quickly made light work of Shizune. Just like the other members of Team Abisu, Udon became a Jonin, and he takes the cake for having what is possibly the single stupidest specialty in the entire series by a mile. Udon can apparently use water release, which isn't really that special. What is more special are his own techniques, which use his snot, to manipulate water around him. Yes, you heard that right. The main technique we've seen him use is the ninja art snot release, which he used to turn the water around him into a large barrier of snot to protect him from falling rubble in Boruto Next Generations. Unfortunately, like most side characters, he doesn't get a lot of screen time, so for now, I'll place him in the low Jonin tier. Sume is pretty much a weaker version of Kiba. She's only really been shown using the most basic of the Inazuka clan's techniques, the Fang Passing Fang. To give you an idea, this is a technique that Kiba was using in part 1 when he was still a Genin. In Shippuden, we did see her try and attack Pain's Preta Path, using a flashbang to take it by surprise, before trying to use the Fang Passing Fang. To her credit, the Preta Path felt threatened enough to block the attack with the Animal Path's body. Kiba showed up after that, and despite the two's best efforts, the Preta Path didn't have a hard time running away from the two of them. Again, this wasn't running away because it was scared or anything, but because it was needed elsewhere. Like Ibisu, Raido is what's called a special Jonin. Jonin who don't really have all the skills to be a Jonin, but are so good in one area that they get the honorary title anyway. So what's Raido's specialty? Well, unlike basically anyone we see in the series, his specialty is assassination. Now, we don't actually know all that much about this side of him, seeing as we never see him doing any assassinating. What we do see is how formidable he is, even for a special Jonin. In part one, he fought the Sound 4 along with Genma. Here, despite being exhausted from an earlier mission, it took the Sound 4 going into the second stage of their curse mark to defeat them. In Shippuden, we saw him momentarily challenging and holding his own against Kakazu. It was only a brief exchange, but even that's saying something against someone as strong as Kakazu. Moving on with another special Jonin, Ayate Gekko. Just like Raido, he's a Kenjutsu expert. His main ability is called the Dance of the Crescent Moon, a sword slash that is apparently so fast it leaves after images behind him. This technique was shown to us during the early parts of Naruto, where something like this was still something to brag about. We never really get to see all that much of Ayate because he died during the tune-in exams. He was the first person to realize that the sand was going to invade the leaf, and he got confronted by Baki while trying to get the information back to the village. They had a short fight, with Ayate showing not only he was skilled in Kenjutsu, but more than fast enough to dodge many of Baki's attacks. Still in the end, he wasn't all that strong, and he died in this battle. Shibi is pretty much instantly cool because he's an Aburame. They have some of the coolest abilities in the show. Controlling their insects, they can use a series of abilities all based around either absorbing the chakra of their opponents or infecting them with some kind of poison. 
Chibi himself is apparently known as the pride of Aburami, so you would think he'd be especially strong, but he really wasn't. We've only seen him try to fight seriously two times in the series, and both times he was more than a little underwhelming. The first time was when he and his entire clan tried to beat Conan and failed miserably. The other time was when he tried to restrain Casey and Naruto from entering the war and failed miserably again. Now, both of these were pretty strong characters, but Shibi still didn't do a whole lot. And that's why I'm ranking him this low on the list. Genma is another special Jonin, and he's the most formidable one we've seen so far. We don't really know that much about his abilities, all we really know are some of his feats. For instance, he alone with Raido was able to force the Sound 4 to use their Curse Mark Stage 2, despite being exhausted from a previous mission. When this happened, Genma was in a lot better shape than the fight against Raido himself was. Then later on, he had a small skirmish with Baki, and he held his own much better than Ayate did. He was someone so skilled that he was chosen for the 4th Akage's personal bodyguard. He's also one of the few ninja who can use the flying Raijin technique, though he does need to do it along with Raido and Iwashi to make it work. Kurenai was the best Genjutsu user in all of Kanoa when the series starts off. Genjutsu itself looks pretty useful at the start of the series too, so you'd think Kurenai would end up ranking pretty high on this list. Unfortunately, as the series goes on, you realize that outside of a couple of Jutsu and some Sharingan and Menge Kyo techniques, Genjutsu is all but useless in the series. Sure, it's the kind of thing that can quickly take out an inexperienced ninja, but overall it's usually more of a distraction than a main threat. For Kurenai, whose main specialty is just Genjutsu, well, it doesn't really give her any options if someone breaks out of Genjutsu. Besides, Kurenai isn't exactly the smartest when using her abilities either. I'm sure we all remember the moment she tried Genjutsu on Itachi of all people, and we all remember how that went. For a Jonin, that showed a lot of promise. You just can't put Kurenai any higher on the list. Anko is someone that needs no introduction. She is someone so talented, she's one of the few people that Orochimaru ever took on directly as a student. Being one of Orochimaru's direct students, she can use many of the same techniques that Orochimaru himself can use, all based around the use of snakes. The only problem is, she doesn't really have any of Orochimaru's stronger, more broken techniques. She just has what little he's taught her. For instance, she can use the Hidden Shadow Snake Hands, which is a pretty cool technique, but isn't much compared to all the crazy things that Orochimaru can do. We haven't seen her fight all that much. Her fight against Orochimaru was about as one-sided as it can get. Her other fight was against Kabuto, and this was even more embarrassing than the previous one. Ibiki is an interrogation expert who uses his understanding of people to break them and extract information from them without lifting a finger. None of this seems all that useful in a straight one-on-one -on -one fight. That is, until you see some of the techniques Ibiki uses. He has possibly one of the strangest summonings of the entire series. He can summon a giant Iron Maiden in the shape of a cat statue that he can use to torture and seal away anything caught inside. He used this during the pain invasion to seal away one of his summons. He can also summon a giant torture chamber, capturing any targets in chains, rendering them all but helpless. He used this against the animal path. Of course, the paths of pain were a bit above his level, and this one did break out, but I doubt most Jonin below him on this list would have been able to handle one of Pain's summons and a path of pain like this. Next, we have Mugino, someone who came to Kanoa to kill the third Hakage. Of course, he was only forced to and eventually did become one of Kanoa's more reliable Jonin. In the Boruto anime, we see him using some pretty interesting techniques. He can use the Earth Release, Stone Pistol Jutsu, which lets him fire out small pebbles that become giant boulders after a few meters in the air. It's a pretty unassuming technique that is definitely going to take plenty of people off guard. He's also kind of a tank, able to use just his arms to hold back a giant stone golem. Besides, it's been shown that he's capable of fighting even when most other shinobi would have long since tied themselves out. Magino is definitely a little underappreciated when it comes to strength, but certainly one of the most efficient and devoted ninja in the history of the Hidden Leaf. Inuichi and the Yamanakas in general are really misunderstood when it comes to scaling them. Yes, they are some of the best support ninja around. They're capable of safely gathering intel as well as coordinating dozens of shinobi all from a safe distance. Besides, if that wasn't enough, they're also super useful in interrogation. What people miss out on is that they might be just as deadly when it comes to a straight-up fight. This is because many of their techniques are either an instant one-shot if they hit or plenty capable of distracting someone long enough to kill them in some other way. We see him use the mind-body disturbance, which makes his enemies not be able to tell friend or foe apart. 
in a one-on-one -on -one fight, he could just as easily take over someone's mind entirely. This is something Inno could easily do as a Genin, so I don't see why her father would struggle with this. We haven't seen Inoichi fight a whole lot, and we never will at this point, but he definitely wasn't a pushover. Alba is another one of those Jonin that seem hyper-specialized to one thing, but are surprisingly capable when you get down to it. Just like Inoichi, Alba is more suited to being a supportive ninja. He can use a jutsu called Scattering Thousand Crows, which spawn a thousand crows, all of which he can use to hide the movements of his allies or just be a big nuisance in and of themselves. He also has an ability that can paralyze his opponents that he can send out through needles. He did this against Kisami, and while it was never going to be able to hold him down at all, stopping him for even a few seconds is a pretty big feat. Besides that, he also briefly swapped hands directly against Kakazu, one of the strongest members of the Akatsuki when it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Again, he didn't ever have the upper hand or anything, but not instantly dying is more than we can say for most Jonin. Asuma was definitely one of the most prominent Jonin in the series, right up to until the point he ended up dying. Asuma was a wind nature expert who did the last thing you'd expect with wind release, used wind release to enhance the range and sharpness of his chakra blades, until they're much more lethal than they were before. In his brief fight with Kasame, he was able to give Kasame a cut on the cheek, it's not much, but probably a lot more than most people would have managed. During the sand invasion, he was able to easily take down nine ninja at once without breaking a sweat. Besides, while Idan might be a bit of a meme when it comes to his physical abilities, he is still one of the Akatsuki. Asuma was able to decapitate Idan, and he'd have won the fight if it wasn't for Kakazu stepping up and mending Idan's neck. All in all, Asuma is one of the most capable Jonin we see in the show. Moegi is definitely someone who more than lived up to everything she was being built up for. Moegi was basically just meant to be comic relief alongside Konohamaru and Udan. This might have been where she stayed, but well. All right, I've just got to go and say it. Not only Moegi can use both water and earth release, but she can somehow use wood release. Yes, that wood release. Probably the single strongest nature transformation out there, and Moegi can use it for some reason. There are two specific juices that are stated in Baruto Data Book Volume 4 being Emerald Green and Vegetation Barrier. We don't know how she acquired the Keke Genkai since there are no physical indications or experimentations with Hashirama cells on her body, but she either got injected with Hashirama DNA like Yamato or she's part of Hashirama's bloodline. Anyway, Moegi can easily become one of the strongest ninja in the leaf, but it's really all about how much screen time she'll get from here on out. Shikaku is one of the most respected shinobi in the show. During the fourth Great Ninja War, he was the one given command of the entire army directly after the five Kage. That says volumes for just how well respected and capable he might have been. He's very capable at using his clan's secret techniques, all revolving around the use of shadows. This goes for everything from the shadow possession jutsu all the way to the black spider lily technique, all of which are basically deadly in a one versus one scenario. More than all of that, though, is the fact that just like his son, he is undoubtedly one of the smartest ninja around. This would, just like his son, allow him to take on ninja he would otherwise have no business fighting, let alone defeating. Shikamaru wears the crown for being the single laziest ninja in the entire Naruto universe. Luckily, he also happens to possess one of the highest potentials we've ever seen. His arsenal isn't that strong on paper, using just the powers of his clan's shadow-based techniques to paralyze or skewer his opponents if they get careless. What really makes him stand out is his intelligence, which is said to be even greater than his father. We've seen him time and time again take on people he should lose to, but ends up beating because he's just that damn smart. Nowhere is this highlighted more than his fight against Idan. Here he took down a literal immortal. That says everything that needs to be said. The Yugas might be some of the biggest ways of potential in the series, but all of their abilities are still more than most ninja would be able to handle. As the head of the clan, he actually knows pretty much all of these techniques and is more than capable of handling his own in a fight. We saw this in the Sand Invasion, where he was easily able to beat several shinobi at once. That's impressive enough, but he has a feat way, way more ridiculous than that. During the fourth Ninja War, not only did he manage to defeat and seal Hisashi, but when coated with the Nine Tails Chakra, he was able to deflect a Jubi Hand. That's a feat no one else so far on this list would have been able to manage. Pretty much everything that can be said about Hiyashi can be just as easily said about Hisashi too. The only difference is that Hisashi has been noted plenty of times as being just a little bit stronger than his brother, which is why he is higher up on the list. In fact, we actually saw him fight his brother during the first part of Naruto, where he had the upper hand. When he was brought back as reanimation, he fought his brother again. 
This time, Natsu looked pretty much even in strength, but the fact that he actually needed Shoji to ultimately restrain and seal his Ashi is another proof that the latter was at least slightly stronger than his brother. Neji was a genius of his clan. Back during the early parts of Naruto, this was a pretty big deal since the Yugas were being built up to be just as strong as the Uchihas were. Of course, we all know how that went, with the Yugas getting shafted, while the Uchihas got more and more crazy moves. Still, despite all that, Neji is pretty well noted for being stronger than any other Yuga we'd seen to that point. By the time of Shippuden, he had surpassed both his father and the head of his clan. All of this is especially impressive because Neji had to learn all of his clan's most secret techniques by himself rather than being taught them. He also has the same feat of battling away one of the Ten Tails hands as Hiyashi. All in all, Neji would have definitely been one of the Leafs' strongest Jonin if he hadn't died abruptly during the war. Everything said about Neji's extreme potential can just as easily be said about Hanabi. Even as a kid, it was noted plenty of times that despite being years younger, she still showed more potential and ability than Inata herself did. It was all about her growing up to fulfill those promises. By the time of Baruto, she's grown up and finally mastered all of the techniques that make the Yugas some of the most fearsome taijutsu fighters in all of Naruto. Maybe Neji would have still been stronger than her if he'd been alive, but at this point, Hinabi has had much longer to train with about the same potential as Neji. Besides, she's already leading a team of her own ninja, and that definitely isn't the kind of thing that just anyone can do. Choza is probably pretty surprising to see all the way up here. The Akamichi aren't exactly known as the strongest clan in Kanoa. Their jutsu allows them to expand in size, which greatly increases their strength and destructive capability. They're also capable of lengthening their limbs, increasing their reach. All of that sounds great, but the only problem is that the Akamichi aren't exactly the fastest people around, so the best option is always to just dodge any of their attacks. Unfortunately, to get the most out of an Akamichi, you need someone like a Nara around to guide them. Despite all that, Choza still has some pretty impressive feats. He was instrumental in the fight against the Diva Path. Sure, this didn't exactly go well, but it was a showing. Much more impressive than this, though, is that he was able to stop Kinkaku's massive tail as well as push back the Ghetto Mazo. This alone puts him high up on the list. Wood release is stupid broken to the point where only a handful of people can naturally use it, and just about everyone else is trying to steal the ability for themselves. It gives access to massive ranged jutsus like the Deep Forest Emergence that can instantly take down scores of ninja. Yamato is one of the few people who have this Keke Genkai. Thankfully, he can't seem to use any of the more ridiculous techniques the wood release is known for. Still, what he can use is impressive enough. Not only is he one of the few people that can suppress a tail beast, he's also able to make massively durable domes that can surround and incapacitate his enemies. For an added surprise, he has the ability to make giant wooden branches out of his arms, impaling and killing anyone he can catch by surprise. All in all, while these techniques are just a weaker version of the first Hikage, that's still enough to get him on here. Konohamaru is undoubtedly one of the strongest jonin we see in Baruto. Even in Shippuden, Konohamaru has feats that most jonin couldn't dream of. He single-handedly beat one of the paths of pain while his own sensei could do nothing but almost get killed. He can freely use the Rasengan, one of the most deadly techniques we ever see in the show, and all of this well before Baruto even starts. In Baruto, he's known as a genius who's even capable of summoning giant toads, one of the few people who can. If you want to get even crazier, then he's literally the only person except for Naruto and Baruto who can add wind release to a Rasengan, and we all know how deadly that can be. It's likely that sooner or later, Konohamaru is going to become Hokage, just like his grandfather. Heck, he even shares a similar summon by the name of Enra, who, if he's anything like his predecessor, is going to be a force to be reckoned with. We're going to be talking about Kakashi during Boruto, not when he had DMS. Since that was a temporary buff, he is never going to get again. Here, Kakashi doesn't have his Sharingan powers anymore, but he has plenty of other ways to make up for the loss of Kamui. He has the Purple Lightning, a better version of the Chidori that doesn't need one to have a Sharingan to safely use. It's pretty much stated that Kakashi is now even stronger and faster than he was during the war. During the war arc, he was keeping up with several version 2 Jinchuriki by himself. Him being even faster and stronger than he was then is scary to think about. Without the Sharingan constantly draining his chakra reserves, Kakashi now has a lot more chakra to put into each of his jutsus. If you want any proof of how crazy Kakashi is now, then in the novels, he made a giant mud wall that was capable of surrounding a village. More than that, he was able to overpower a six-path jutsu all by himself, a ridiculous feat all on its own. 
Just like with Kakashi, we're only going to talk about Guy up until the eighth gate, since he has to die to go that far. That isn't really that big of a weakness though, as even going up till the seventh gate is probably going to one shot most non six pass characters. Guy was so ridiculously strong that just him showing up versus Itachi and Kasami was enough to make them leave, despite them having pretty much one shot Kakashi at that point. Guy was also the one who overpowered Kasami so easily that he pretty much had to kill himself so that he wouldn't get captured. This was a Kasami that Guy had to hold back against because he didn't want to kill him after all. All in all, there's a reason Madara himself said that Guy was the strongest in Taijutsu, and this was true whether he used the eight gates or not. Lee being Guy's heir and having his exact same work ethic has everything going for him that Guy did. By the time Baruto rolls around, he's finally capable of going all the way up to the eighth gate, which means that he could open the seventh gate in any fight he's a part of. We haven't really seen him fight in Baruto, but even at the end of Shippuden, he was able to keep up and help Guy in his fight to take down Madara. That's a pretty impressive speed feat when you think about it. The only reason I've ranked Lee above Guy is because the whole theme of Baruto is about the new generation being stronger than the people that had come before. I don't see any reason why this wouldn't be true for Lee, as it is for every character we've seen so far. Sakura is definitely the single strongest Jonin that Kanoa has. We don't even need to talk about her ridiculous medical techniques, which probably make her the greatest doctor alive. Note she has feats which directly put her well over most of the characters on this list. During the war, she said that she had finally caught up to Naruto and Sasuke, with the two being KCM Naruto and EMS Sasuke at the time. I know even saying that is a meme, but the data books pretty much confirmed that this was true, so I'll have to take their word for it. More than that though, Hashirama himself said that Sakura had surpassed Tsunade herself, and he'd know better than anyone. So big buff for Sakura that I now scale a bit higher than KCM1 Naruto and EMS Sasuke from the war arc. For those interested, the source is Naruto Data Book 4, written by Kishimoto himself. So Sakura's strongest Jonin of the Leaf, of course, the ones with the strongest forms is still Guy and Kakashi, but considering that both of their forms are one a suicidal move and the other a temporary buff, I felt like leaving both forms out of the list. That's it for this video, it was a bit of a long one, so thanks for staying all the way to the end, leave a like if you enjoyed the content and I will see you next time. This is Anime Scout out, bye!